I'd like to welcome Greg Powell uh, to this series called Culture Stories, where we invite people who are deeply engaged in the business of culture to spill the beans, if you like, and tell us about their experience. So Greg is the Senior Director of Employer Product Marketing at Indeed.com. So Greg, welcome to this series. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm going to start off with a general question, if I may, which is about the word culture. It's a very all-encompassing word, concept. How do you describe it? And what are the, let's call it, constituent parts of, of what forms culture in your experience? Well, to me, uh, culture is a set of social norms you establish with the group that you work with or the group that you interact with. And um, those social norms are established, in my opinion, through day-to-day -day interactions. So while a lot of companies try and set or a lot of organizations try and set their culture by putting a plaque on the wall, I actually think what's or, or through, you know, uh, big company meetings uh, twice a year, I actually think um, culture is best when it's broken down into the day-to-day -day interactions that people have with one another. And those social norms start to influence everything, uh, the way that people behave, the way they interact with each other, the way they communicate, um, and uh, the way that they set goals for themselves, the way that they um, uh, train each other. I think all of those things come into play. I do think that there's an important role for leaders in culture to set, to help reinforce and set the norms. And so um, I think that um, culture is also best when it's intentional and that leaders can do themselves a great service by being very intentional about the culture they set and uh, making sure that um, their people managers reinforce those cultural norms and those social norms throughout because one leader can only do so, so one leader can only do so much uh, with regard to culture um they need they need all their people managers to reinforce it on a day-to-day -day basis yeah and just a quick side question here greg do you think things have changed i mean i i totally agree with that description do you think things have changed since the pandemic since we've been going into broadly speaking a hybrid way of working how you know that those small interactions that you talk about have we lost some of those that's a great question um i can tell you that on my team what we do is we're even more intentional than we were previously uh with with setting those cultural norms and and actually um documenting them um and trying to reinforce them whenever we can so i think whereas in a um, in a, in an environment where we were all in the office and working together, maybe you didn't have to be quite as explicit about cultural norms because they were, you know, reinforced every time you went to the water cooler. Now, uh, you do need to be a little bit more, uh, explicit and leaders communication is becomes even more important, I think, because you don't get those informal interactions where you can reinforce your way of working and your way of operating and your way of interacting with others, you need to be very deliberate about it and, and very cognizant about it when you show up on Zoom. I, I think you're so right. So I think that this thing about communication and being very deliberate, the, the, the language we use, which I think totally endorses what you're saying is about role modeling, role modeling, even the smallest thing, which of course you could do, uh, on a call with a hybrid team, for instance, it might be about ensuring everyone is heard at every meeting and is given the same airtime. Because it might be that one of your values is around equality and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things one of the things that we that we focused on we, we have uh, several principles. We call them positive principles that we try and operate by. And because um, our emphasis is on building a positive organization and which we can talk about and, and I'm happy to define, but um, the um, vulnerability is one of the things that we value. And that starts with me. I have to be vulnerable 
in order for anyone else to feel comfortable being vulnerable. So I have to lead there. Uh, and uh, another one that we that we uh, take pride in is um, constructive confrontation. This is not sniping or arguing for the sake of arguing, but healthy debate, uh, I think is very important. And I need to role model that I can be uh, uh, proven wrong in a meeting or that people can debate me, uh, in order for other people to feel comfortable. And so, um, so those are a few things that the, where the leader and the communication style plays a really important role in role modeling, as you said. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I'm going to not, you know, to bring this up a notch now and, and see if we can nail some great examples. I'd love to ask you for some around, experiencing the power of culture what are the stories of for you where you've really seen culture make a significant difference what was the impact so um i can give an example uh from when i uh started earlier at, in at indeed where uh my team uh at the very you know when i first joined was understaffed and um, didn't feel like they could have, they couldn't, didn't feel like they had sort of the permission to have that healthy debate that I mentioned earlier, that let's talk things through, let's, let's be open about it. And uh, early on, uh, I remember being in some meetings where uh, we were meeting with a third party, a, a, a cross-functional partner uh, that we relied on. And I was getting these Slack notifications from my team saying, well, I don't think that's right, or I disagree with what that person is saying. And I thought to myself, well, why are you telling me that? Why don't you tell the person that you disagree with? And then we, when I probed a little bit more, I uncovered that they were very uncomfortable. They felt like it was combative and confrontational and rude to do that. And, um, and so we, we did a few exercises to get people comfortable with, with that and, and to show how it could be done in a positive way so that you were able to communicate with that collaborate that collaborator um and say well you know here's i disagree and here's why um and we really focused on that and we got um amazing results from that in that other teams started loving to collaborating with our team they viewed us um as role models in how to kind of, you know, have that healthy debate and challenge one another in a healthy way to get to the best outcome. And ultimately, what ended up happening was whenever a new role on my team opened up, um, we had like this huge avalanche of, of applicants from across the company because they saw what we were trying to do. And, uh, and we knew we were on our way. And we called that attraction of resources that one of the signals that we would get that we were doing the right thing was attraction of resources. And that we saw that happen both with um, people applying for open roles on the team, but also in the financial resources that we got and the time and attention from other leaders in all the way up to the CEO um, in adopting some of the language that we were using and, uh, and some of the goals that we set. So it really cascaded uh, throughout and became quite a powerful um, uh, quite a powerful tool. And, and it comes back to this word that you used earlier, Greg, about intentionality. Mm. And I, I would add to that this consistency, almost dogged <laughs> approach. This is what we believe in. Here's a standard, a value, call it what you will, a behavior, set of behaviors. And we're going to keep working at this. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you're absolutely right. People notice this and they start gravitating towards you. I, I was can ask the, the follow-up question, which is around managing a culture. And I think you've touched on this already, you know, whether business leaders can get away. And I think there are some with going, ah, culture doesn't need me. Mm. It'll find its own level. Mm -hmm. So I think, that, yeah, I have some <laughs> thoughts on that. If, if, it, <laughs> <thought yeah>. you <laughs> if, if it goes, so I think the status quo, and I'm speaking from experience, mostly in for-profit enterprises. So I can't speak as much to say universities or the public sector or anything like that, but I would imagine this, this mostly applies in most organizations. 
Um, but definitely the, uh, the, the businesses that I've, uh, that I've held roles within is that the status quo is somewhat transactional. And so the ingoing assumption is that businesses are run in a very transactional way and culture is somewhat transactional. So the status quo, you know, if you think about it as the, you know, standard distribution of a bell curve, the big peak in the middle of the bell curve, where most organizations are, uh, um, uh, that most organizations uh, fall within would have, and, and this, by the way, is not my idea. This comes from uh, a University of Michigan emeritus professor named Robert Quinn, uh, who I've who I've who I've studied, um, who's who's uh, who has some wonderful insights on this topic. But he basically outlines this idea of the bell curve, and most organizations fall within the middle, which is which is kind of the status quo, where it's equal part my interpretation of it is that it's equal parts um, reward and punishment, right? You get rewarded for hitting your goals and you get punished for missing your goals, right? And what ends up happening in organizations like that with that type of culture is that people don't like taking risks because they want to get rewarded and they don't want to get punished. And what's the best way to get rewarded? Set kind of easy targets to hit and hit your targets and then talk about how you hit your targets risk taking is more challenging at other ends of the of the spectrum you have the toxic organizations which i'm sure all of us have seen at some point where uh you know kind of infighting happens and people try and undermine each other and it can get very kind of negative and at the other end is a positive organization where people have a collective vision and and purpose of where they want to go and i think Positive out organizations, again, according to, to Robert Quinn, actually outperform the status quo organizations uh, financially. Like he's proven it that financially they outperform uh, the organizations that sit at the status quo. That really got me interested. And that was one of the threads early on that pulled me in and said, well, this isn't just, you know, because I personally want to want to operate in a, in a positive organization, which I do. Uh, but it's also, uh, it, uh, it also can yield some really positive results, uh, business results. And so that drew me in. And that's where I think this intentionality comes from. It's like, if we want to get to this right end of the bell curve, we need to be intentional because the status quo, we will always get pulled toward that center of the bell curve. That is, if you're not intentional, that is where you'll end up, it, it, I think. I just want to throw in a quick question here because it, I think we're going to be dancing around this subject and it's right in your block hole at Indeed, is about Gen Z. And we've come out of a pandemic which itself has really changed work and the position of work in people's lives and you know the value and meaning of it. And now we have this generation that's been, that's been coming into the workforce now for a number of years probably just before and during the pandemic. And it really does have a different set of principles and values and view on, on the world of work. And I just wonder whether you've got any thoughts. I'm sure you've got a lot of data as well around, is this changing, this new generation really changing how we think about work? I, I think so. And I think it's a very healthy discussion. The, you know, uh, Certainly, my parents' uh, generation, you know, my father, uh, and to some extent myself being part of Generation X, you know, the assumption was you had to work really, really hard to advance. And if there was a choice to be made between, you know, kind of your personal life and your job, your career often came first, right? And, and you would prioritize things over that. But then we started getting into, even before the pandemic, this concept of burnout and the advent of smartphones and, you know, having uh, broadband uh, Internet access at home, you know, made us available at all hours. And so that cultural norm of work kind of, you know, uh, work wins when pitted against family, friends, your personal health, uh, that became it got really unhealthy. I think it got to unsustainable levels and people started experiencing burnout. And so I think the challenge that younger generations are posing is a really healthy discussion that we're having of 
what do I want my life to be about? And where do I want work to fall within that? And I think, I mean, from my perspective, we actually, one of the principles that we have on my team is, is rest and work-life balance. It does me no good if my team is working weekends and late into the evening every night. Sure, I might get some short-term returns and I might be able to uh, respond to my GM a little bit more quickly, maybe one day faster and say, well, here's those results you asked for. But at what cost? Those people are going to get burned out and they're going to leave or they're going to come to me with mental health issues that ultimately just slow us down. So I think it's, it's, a, I think it's a very healthy discussion to have. And, and so just one follow on question from that. Do you feel that organizations are responding to that conversation or is it a bit of a square peg in a round hole at the moment? It's a bit of a standoff. Oh, I think, I think organizations are responding to it. I mean, I can speak from uh, Indeed. We have something called U Days. Every month we get one day not affiliated with a holiday. Uh, it's always a Friday, at least in North America, it's always a Friday that we get off one day a month. And I can tell you that is one of my favorite benefits because, you know, my kids are in school, my spouse is working, and uh, it's a day for me. And it's a true mental health day. Uh, it's wonderful. And, and that's the way that Indeed has acknowledged that of, you know, most of us are working from home predominantly now. And the separation of work and personal time gets really muddied. And it's easy to fire up the laptop or check your check Slack on your on your mobile device um, at all hours of the day and night. And so we need to be very deliberate about saying, no, nope, you need a day to to rest. You need a true day to rest and uh, so that you don't get burned out. So that's, I, I think, and I don't think we're alone. I think other companies have acknowledged that as well. Yeah. So I want to come on to, I mean, what you and I will understand because we're both passionate about culture, that this great sort of uh, series of tensions that lie within culture. You, on one level, of course, how you experience the culture of an organization is incredibly personal. Hmm. You know, how you want me to behave and operate on a day-to-day -day basis. This is me behaving in a certain way within, of course, the collective environment. So on one hand, it's personal, but on the other, culture is a collective experience. Hmm. Similarly, another interesting, you could call it tension, is culture is always, you mentioned this earlier, Greg, leader-led hmm. and then people-driven. And it's that dance, really, because mm. after a while, the leaders need to move off and let the people lead it Absolutely. and run it. And then that's the great barometer of success. Totally. And yet, then again, I think there's so much of culture that is visible, but so much that is invisible. I was speaking to a, a, a firm that's predominantly French, and they have this phrase, le non dit, the unsaid a lot of, and and we know that culture back in the days when we're in the office was those informal conversations bumping into someone water cooler all the stuff that you can't measure someone gave once a huge figure like 80 percent of businesses around the informality not the formality so i just wonder uh, a question for you whether you agree with those sort of dichotomies tensions and how you reconcile them yeah, what we what I've seen, at least on, on my team, as we focused on culture, is that everyone has something that they take away from it. Um, and something, so we have 10 positive principles um, on, on my team. And we review them every month and we give out awards for following the 10 positive principles. And, uh, and so we celebrate them. But different people really gravitate toward, you know, different of, of the 10 of the 10 positive principles, they may gravitate toward one or two more than others. And, yeah. and so they can make it personal to them. Um, if you, if you find a way to, uh, so there's, there's kind of a couple thoughts. If you, if you make your, your positive principles, or if you make your intentional cultural norms um, inclusive, then people can find a way to, to make it meaningful to them, which I do think is important. The other thing is that, um, and this might kind of be a cultural norm in and of itself, but to me, I think it's very important that people are their best selves at work. 
and that they bring their true selves into work. And uh, we spend so much time working that, you know, if you feel like you have to conform to, uh, you know, a really rigid culture that you don't identify with, then it will ultimately affect your performance um, because you're not going to feel natural and comfortable in that environment. And I, I read a, uh, and it'll cause anxiety. And I read a, a, a study once that said that when people are under lots of stress, their IQ drops up to 13 points. And, uh, and so you can imagine that if you're feeling a lot of cognitive dissonance in the culture of your organization and how you personally want to behave, that can lead to a lot of anxiety, which will ultimately end up coming through in, in your work product. So I think it's important that you create a culture. Now, some of this will be self-selection, right? There will be certain cultures that people don't like, and so they gravitate away from it. Uh, and other cultures that people do like, and they will, be gra they will gravitate toward it. And so I think that that also is, can be a benefit of culture, is that you will get the best work out of people who align with that culture you set. But to your question about that, that dichotomy, I do think that there is one, but that's why I think it's important that when you create the positive principles, that they're, I, that they're defined in a way that people can find meaning in it for them. Um, and so that they can, they can take ownership over some of those things in their, in their personal lives. I think you're, you're so right, Greg. Uh, the, how we approach it, it's exactly the same principle, is we, we look at a behavior, we look at a value, and we just ask the question, how will it benefit you to be more bold, to be more curious in your life? And you sit back and go, well, I've got all these interests and I've got a couple of kids. And, I get the, and, and of course, it's quite easy for them to construct. That's how it's, you know, uh, I need my kids to be really bold. So, of course, if I can just have a little bit more of a bold mindset, maybe some tools and techniques that I can pass on to them, that, that really makes sense for me. Bold may not be one of my values, but I see the value to me. Right, now, work. What can you teach me? And, and then just to your point, they're on board. They're there. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask now, I want to pan back. It's like a long shot of a camera. Um, I just wonder whether in these days, and these are quite intense days that we're all living in, it's easy, possible for leaders to have that big view, big cultural ambition you know, how I want us to be, how I want us to move forward in, in extraordinary ways, as opposed to, okay, I can see, it can, if we can just be a little bit more aligned, you know, those one or two things that get you to the next year, get you to the next mm. set of results. I'm wondering whether we're losing some of these bigger ideas around cultural possibility. What are you seeing? Oh, I don't, well... That's an interesting question, right? Because we're kind of on the, it feels like, you know, for the past year, we've been on the brink of a recession, although no one's quite declared that we're in a recession. Uh, and so I think a lot of companies are starting to think hard about around performance. And I think that um, there seems to be in the minds of a lot of leaders in the, again, in the private sector, that there's this tension between culture and performance. And the more you invest in culture, the less well you'll perform. And that the, the idea of building a strong culture was in part because there was a war for talent. And so you had to invest in culture in order to attract talent. But now that uh, you know, hiring has, has slowed to some extent in some sectors, it's slowed a little bit. Maybe there's an opportunity to, to focus more on performance uh, and efficiency, but I would still argue you can get that through culture. You can get strong performance through culture. You can get efficiency through culture. Um, you know, there are examples where, again, where teams have a higher purpose. And, and my team has experienced, I've experienced this on my team um, at Indeed as well, where when you have a common shared goal um, and, and a sense of purpose, people voluntarily do things for the greater good, such as cost-cutting exercises, 
it doesn't feel like, oh, all I'm giving, I'm giving up part of the culture or I'm giving up the thing like we used to have pizza parties and now we can't have pizza parties. Pizza parties were the culture. Pizza parties are not the culture, right? That, uh, that you know, the are going to mini golf or something. That was the culture. Well, no, that's, that's an expression. That's a way to reinforce the culture, but that is not the culture. And you can actually have a really excellent performance. In fact, in some time, in some cases, performance comes more naturally when you do have a strong culture and that, you know, right now is a, a, a very important time to invest in culture because, uh, like I said, just recently, we've had discussions uh, around, uh, you know, certain budgets that we've had to that we've had to manage very closely uh, in ways that in past years we hadn't had to manage them very closely. And people are voluntarily coming to me saying, yeah, I don't think we need, we can cut this. It's okay. We can cut this. Or when it comes to prioritization, you know what? That person's project is actually, I think that's a, a slightly higher priority than mine. Where did this come from? Like, you know, I mean, in you know, previous <laughs> organizations that I've worked for, that doesn't happen. People try and hold on to that because they think, well, if I don't get it this year, I'm not going to get it next year. And, um, and they have a, a it, you know, the, the, the really strong cultures that I've seen, there's that because there's that higher purpose, um, there's a, a more of a sense of, of, of teamwork and that when the group succeeds, they individually will succeed as well. And, and that's been really, really interesting to see. It's so interesting hearing you talk, Greg, because a lot of, a lot of what we both say in this world almost sounds like cliches you know <laughs> it's the team yeah. it's the and you know it all this sort of stuff and and yet it's just so true um you some people may have heard it a thousand times ago yeah 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 but these these are the plinths and it's so interesting what you say about some people finding this tension between culture and performance we're finding it flips the other way people are coming to us going you know what? The team's a bit flat. Yeah. Team performance. There's this phrase around languishing. Mm. You know, we're treading water. We're doing okay, but not in great. Yeah. And they're turning to a cultural solution. Yes. Again, your point very much. Where's that theme? Where's that big higher purpose that that will draw us together? But then there's other aspects that will drive this higher performance. And and many of them are going to be cultural. Oh, absolutely. And if you think about, you know, earlier we discussed that idea of the bell curve and the status quo being equal parts, uh, you know, reward and punishment. Uh, and, and you can imagine that if you're operating in a world like that or in a culture like that, you're not rewarded for taking risks or for thinking boldly, right? Again, it might be on the plaque, uh, you know, in the conference room, but when it comes to the actual behavior that's rewarded um, and the actual behavior that's, that's, uh, that becomes the norm, if that's the way that you're operating, you will not get differential performance because people are going to be avoiding punishment. And when they're in a mindset of avoiding punishment, they are not taking risks because risks can get you punished. Uh, and so, uh, and so it's, it's really, you know, it's, I think you're absolutely right. This culture is so critical to think about, well, how are people behaving and are they willing to take risks? I'm not saying, um, you know, every single employee should take a moonshot risk, but a healthy amount of risk and thinking boldly can be the thing that leads to breakthrough ideas. And you need to create space for that. People need, you cannot, or it's very difficult to do that in the status quo uh, culture. Mm. Now, what, one of the areas I want to move us on a little bit, uh, often about first steps. So when we're working with clients, it's always, okay, so where do I start? We're going to do some cultural work and I might have some opportunities over here and some issues that need challenging to get some sorting out. So clearly that's going to be that. And one of the ways we find it, but I'm very interested in your answer, is you have to have leaders engaged and involved. That That's absolutely critical. The first step is that conversation, that alignment. But we often find that that coupled with something at the grassroots, if you like, so quite junior people 
just getting fired up around culture, being given little bits of responsibility, you know, come up with ideas, this sort of stuff is very powerful as a counterweight mm. to the exec. It sort of holds them to account mm. in some ways. Mm. Have you thought, you know, are there some examples you can give us from Indeed or elsewhere around how you've initiated cultural conversations or cultural action? Yeah. Well, as a team, those positive principles that I mentioned earlier, we chose them as a team. Um, that like we actually, it, it didn't come from me or anyone else uh, or any one person or any one leader. It came from... Um, it, it came from the team organically from, from everyone. So I would say that, um, yeah, I, from, from my experience, uh, co-creating that get, allowed people to have some ownership. Now, what's been interesting is we chose those about two years ago and they've lived on because we've had really strong uh, retention and leaders that have bought into that have continued reinforcing that, those culture norms, but we've hired a bunch of people since then. And so what I've done is, again, I've, I've had to go back to that list and, uh, and role model it several times in order, to, uh, in order to reinforce it with the new hires. Um, but I do think that, yeah, there's, um, I would say there's a couple things that, that yeah, um, inviting people from all levels to participate can be very useful, very helpful. There's also something that leaders can do, and, and they can also work with, with people at all levels on this, and that is, what is the team's purpose? And if you start there, if you figure out what your purpose is as, a, as an organization, then what you deem important culturally can flow from that. Um, and, and to start with the purpose, I, I think is a, is a good starting point, right? Cause you've got, you've got the executives who are, who are eager and, and excited to get going, you know, like, let's do this, let's invest in culture. And I would say you can, you can invite, uh, people of all levels to participate and focus on that, that purpose. That's where, that's where I would say uh, it's a good idea to start. I mean, you know, it, it's the Daniel Pink principle, isn't it? You know, purpose mastery autonomy you know in effect the money will look after itself yeah you know but this is what drives this is really what drives people to want to work for you yes i just wondered if we could get a little bit more specific on that that indeed example of of these 10 positive principles and if you could describe for us that like that first meeting of which or, or how it came about that they said let's have some principles yeah make them positive. Yeah, it was it's in a, a lovely. Yeah. How did it happen? Yeah, well, it was in a workshop that we that we did uh with Robert Quinn. Actually, we ended up bringing Robert Quinn in and he gave us a lecture on that bell curve and the status quo and to kind of build up uh the idea that uh this is probably what you've seen historically. This is not going to be another one of those, you know, culture workshops where you throw some things and they end up on a plaque on the wall. This is like actually a way of operating um, that can be extremely um, effective. And he had the research and the data to prove it. Um, so we started there and that got the team leaning in saying, oh yeah, I think other organizations that I've worked for have been more in the status quo. Indeed, by the way, definitely operates on the right end of the spectrum in general. Um, and so I think we have a strong culture. I think it is by and large, a very positive culture. So it was not um, anathema to the rest of the company's culture for me to, to, to run an exercise like this. It wasn't counter to the rest of the culture. Um, but we did want to identify our own within that broader culture and be very deliberate about it. And um, so when it, by the time it came to the positive principles, people were pretty excited because uh, we had kind of discussed the uh the kind of the idea behind it and why culture matters and uh and because it was crowdsourced people were very uh eager to 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 select from the list of 20 we also did an exercise as part of these workshops where we found the principle that was important to us and we actually wrote letters to each other and said here's what I'm going to work on. It was like an informal commitment. 
I this positive principle is very important to me personally, and I'm going to work on it. And here's what I need from you. And I got letters from everyone, uh, and with them saying, "Here is uh, of these, you know, positive principles that we're that we're looking at. Here's where I need your help, or here's where I want to hold you accountable." And that was wonderful. And because it was facilitated, I think even though the team at the time they'd gotten to know me a little bit, I'd been on the job for about six months by then. Um, I, I probably hadn't. Um, probably not all of them trusted me uh, unconditionally at that time. Right. You know, it just, I just hadn't been in the role long enough. And they hadn't seen, you know, my, my leadership hadn't been put to the test. And so having an environment that was facilitated where they could directly ask something of me, set a really nice tone for how we would be building the culture that like, no, you should hold me accountable for this. Um, and the buck stops with me and However, I can help you uh, either by changing my own behaviors or by supporting your journey. You can let me know and I will do that. It was a really great exercise. Great. This is why I so enjoy these conversations <laughs> because it's great speaking to someone who gets it, but this it's living it. It's mm. taking responsibility and account, understanding. You mentioned it earlier. There are moments in which you felt very vulnerable. Um, you know, because you understand the, the you have to role model, you have to lead, you have to show these things. And at times that's really hard. And you've just beautifully illustrated this idea that I was speaking about earlier about making it personal. People going, this positive principle, and I love this language, by the way, positive principle, mm. is really important to me. They may even have described why. It's because I belong to this church or this choir or this team and, mm -hmm. and it's teamship and it's coaching skills and, and, and so on. And, and now I, I, and I want something from you mm -hmm. in return. And to write this stuff down, um, you know, I'm a great believer in these days of tablets and mm -hmm. mobile phones to write mm -hmm. stuff. It sort of lodges it in the brain a little deeper than tapping it. And... And then you, you've got it there on paper and you can share it, you can display it and, you know, whatever it is. And we've got 47 letters in the team mm -hmm. and we're all asking something of each other. And then, as you say, new people come in. We've hired a bunch of people. We need to role model these things again. Yeah. But I'm sure part of that is in going, oh, OK, of these 10, this one, I think we need to refresh. Mm -hmm. you know, there comes a time. Yeah to show you that you're adapting mm -hmm. to what's happening. Mm -hmm. In fact, we are actually, um, because the composition of the team has changed in the last few months, we've actually talked about doing exactly that, is making it feel fresh. Because at some point, the the original folks, for by and large, are still with the team that selected the positive principles over two years ago. Um, but the composition of the team has changed and we want them to feel included as well. And so we can make some adjustments to it. And that's great because we want them to feel ownership over it too. And, and I think that's right. I mean, the world is changing so fast. Context change that two years, three years time for a refresh that, that feels positive and mm. good to me rather than, yeah, it only lasted three years. Right. No, I think I yeah, think it's good. you can actually and you can inject a little bit of life into it when you revisit it and make it feel fresh and make it feel relevant as the context in which we're living changes. Um, you know, like I said, when we started this process, the economy was in a different position than it's in now than it is, is in today. And so the context is, has changed. And so uh, perhaps different principles feel more important today uh than uh than two years ago and and that's that's a good thing like we can adapt to that now as, as we round this up there's uh, i'd love just to pick your brains a little bit about great cultures that you've been part of i mean clearly indeed is one that you've been not just part of but fashioned and and i just wonder what are uh, what have been maybe the main plinths, if you like, 
uh, of successful cultures that you've experienced. And I wonder whether you have a couple of examples. Yeah. Uh, so obviously the team that I've talked about at Indeed has been a, has been a big one. Uh, that's been a wonderful experience. Um, there was a, a team that I, where I, where I used to work at Intuit and there was a, a team at Intuit um, that, uh, where we really rallied around a common purpose and we weren't explicit. This was a cross-functional team. Uh, the, the, the actual team that I led at that time was relatively small, but we were part of a much bigger team, cross-functional team, including sales and finance and customer support and product management and engineering. And we had a shared culture, um, of, um, there was a little bit of an underdog mentality. Uh, that we had that was a lot of fun because um, it it freed us to kind of think creatively and to take those bold swings. And so I would say that culture was very much about big thinking, right? And it was so much fun because uh, we really built something special. Um, all teams were aligned on a on that common purpose of delivering better, more affordable. In this case, it was payroll services, better, more affordable payroll services uh, for small businesses that were struggling to figure out all the rules and regulations around payroll. And we took a lot of pride in our ability to deliver a fantastic service at a very, very affordable price um, uh, compared to compared to the competition. And that uh, but the fact was that we were just getting started with this new service. And so we could think boldly. It was kind of the early days. It was almost a startup within a much larger company. And we had a, an identity um, as kind of scrappy, bold thinkers that were going to disrupt this, uh, this established space. And, um, and we were very supportive of one another. So that boldness and that, um, that kind of uh, that shared sense of purpose really came through. And then I'll go to high school sports, if you can imagine that, going way back. Another really strong experience I had was in high school um, on a sports team that I played on uh, where uh, it was my senior year. And we had that. It was a similar shared sense of purpose where all of us, uh, there was also a little bit of an underdog mentality of this team as well. But we had that shared sense of purpose that we could do some great things if we all worked together to do them. And we did, and different people, what was really wonderful to see, and I've seen this across all of those teams, is that at different moments, there was spontaneous leadership, right? And that was one of the, the signals that I knew that across all of those teams, that people that maybe historically have been quiet or maybe didn't see their role as central to the success of this, this vision or this purpose, that with that shared sense of purpose, you had people... Um, from all corners of the organization and all skill levels and all levels of seniority stepping forward to participate in visible ways. And that happened on the high school sports team that happened at Intuit and that's happening at Indeed where you see people really speaking their truth. Um, and I have to imagine that culture plays a role in that. Um, you know, I, I just I just believe it does. And it was just in all of those cases, it kind of is one of those situations to me that just makes you realize when uh, when different people step up that it's not about me as a leader. It's about the purpose and people seeing value in the purpose. And when they can identify with the purpose, they will step forward and they will spontaneously lead and you will get better results then if everything goes through the leader and there's, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and the leader is driving everything, that shared sense of purpose becomes almost like the rising tide that lifts all the boats. Um, so uh, that, that's been a common thread that I've seen with all of those teams. Greg, it's, these are such lovely stories. It, I mean, what you're hinting at is, of course, culture is everywhere. Culture mm. is at home. Each of us in our own family groupings, whatever they are, there is a culture, mm -hmm. a student house, you know, family, wherever it is, there is a culture. And then there is culture that exists in those things that we do outside home. And then, of course, you know, we often talk about business culture. There's someone I'm coaching at the moment for whom this has been brought into stark relief because he's just joined a football team in a new city. 
and the onboarding process has been so positive, so wonderful, so all encompassing. He's looking at his business going, it's not happening over here, mm. <laughs> but making him go, maybe it could, because I've just had the most extraordinary experience here. That's world class. And let, let's have a look over here. Yeah. Um, Greg, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, you have been uh, a, th throughout the whole 50, full 60 minutes, a passionate advocate for this idea of purpose. And I want to end on this because for some people, they'll go, OK, well, you know, the company purpose. Uh, but what you're also talking about is, well, we can have a team purpose within the bigger umbrella. Absolutely. But this thing called a purpose is essential. And you keep on coming back to it. I'm totally with you on this. But I just wonder if we could just end on that a little bit more. Can you give me some examples of different purposes or, or, or different ways in which you position that and picture it? And do you need to ask permission of the, the bosses to have your own team purpose? Um, so I'll give you an example. Indeed, uh, one of, I, I would say, uh, our purpose, uh, well, our, our mission is we help people get jobs. That's what's printed on the t-shirts. Um, in, in marketing, we've taken that even a step further and we have sort of a thought leadership pillar on the world can work better. And I believe that is a, a true underlying purpose where if you break that down and say the world can work better, well, how? It's not just about our product, right? It's about something bigger than that. I find that extremely motivating. And uh, when we publish um, you know, articles on that, people talk about it right and so that's that's an that's an example of of a purpose that we have where it's our job as experts in this field to help people understand how the world can work better um and then hanging off of that are lots of things around workplace happiness helping people um with barriers to employment gain employment um, there's all sorts of, uh, of, of, of actions that we take as an organization that ladder up to that purpose, um, both in and outside of marketing, um, that I think uh, is, is a great example. Um, and and, and to, to your second question, can an organization within a, a bigger organization, can a team within a bigger organization have their own purpose? Absolutely. I think they should feel connected right um uh they should feel connected with one another but i think absolutely they can have a purpose because your job let's say you work on a customer support team well uh how do how would you translate the world can work better what is your purpose within that well it can be to make sure that um our clients are absolutely thrilled with the product that we have or to resolve their issues and uh to leave them smiling uh, you know, every time they interact with us, there can be a lot of different ways you can come up with a purpose that fits within this, this, uh, this, this bigger uh, purpose for a larger organization. Absolutely feasible. It's so lovely. You've just reminded me, we worked for a, a, an American university last year doing some work and working with the, the landscaping and estates team. Just they, they, their sort of mantra is we work for admissions. This place looks pristine every day. You never know who's going to work, walk in with their kid, you know, looking for two years down the line. Our job is to work for admissions and to make everyone wants to come here because it's just so beautiful. You know, how how inspiring is that rather than we cut the grass and yeah, exactly, things, you know, twice a day. Exactly. You know, it's just genius. Yeah. It, it raises yeah. it up. Yeah, absolutely. One of the one of the ways that 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 I think one of the ways that I think actually you also see it is when people, you know, everyone's got work in normal working hours. There are certain norms around. Some people have actual hours they work and other people, there's sort of a range of hours that's deemed acceptable. Uh, but, you know, what I think where you start to see the impact of culture is when people start thinking about things outside of those normal working hours and say, you know, I was thinking about this last night. And when you start hearing things like that, and I could see that university having 
employees working for that team that think that way, right? What's going to make this just look outstanding? And they think about that at night or in the shower, an idea comes to them. I think you're onto something when that stuff starts to happen. Greg, we've come to the end and we've covered everything. You know, I've been writing down words about it's personal, uh, asking for permission, intentionality, proof, of course, that culture works and it does. Uh, culture versus performance. Which way do you go on that? Um, and we, we come we come back full circle to purpose mm-hmm. uh, and having that as a central sort of DNA spine that that runs down the business and helps every team on it. And I think you're absolutely right. It's it's been a pleasure and an insight. Really inspiring to listen to you. So thank you for your time. Oh, well, thanks so much for having me. uh, Oh, it's a a pleasure. And um, look forward to speaking again soon. Absolutely. Thanks again.